We'll continue with what I hope is an extremely in informative and interesting event. This panel we want to discuss maybe <laughs> the most public litigation going on in America, uh, which is the NFL concussion litigation with 4,000 former, play former players suing the NFL to be heard here in Philadelphia, at least the, the next round, which is going to be the dismissal argument for CBA purposes of the player's case. 4,000 players suing, that is one-third of all former NFL players have joined this lawsuit. Here to discuss it, we, I, do, I do want to say we did offer the NFL an opportunity to send a lawyer or representative. At one point, they <laughs> did accept, and then they declined uh, with the case being so sensitive. And I know our representative of the plaintiff's side is going to be limited in, in what he can say with it being an active litigation. But let's talk about it. To my right is Jay Gordon Cooney, one of the managing partners at Morgan Lewis, a distinguished alumni of this law school. Again, he is not <laughs> an NFL attorney. He is representing that side for us, and he's been gracious enough to do that, having handled defense work for class actions. To my immediate right is Paul Anderson, founder of NFLConcussionLitigation.com. Paul has become a cult hero to people studying this issue, people studying this litigation, and a real example that I can use to my students, someone fresh out of law school, that has made a name for himself in the industry. We're happy to have him. And to my left is Saul Weiss, Anna Paul Schwartz, distinguished alumni of this law school, one of the lead co-counsels in the litigation against the NFL. I will let each of them talk about their, their feelings on the case, and then we'll have a discourse about it. Gordon? Thanks, Andrew. Um, good morning. Let me set the stage a little bit so that people understand what's in the multi-district litigation in Philadelphia. Um, first, um, there are a large number of individual personal injury claims brought by former players. And second, there is a putative class action uh, in which uh, Mr. Weiss is one of the lead counsel um, that's brought on behalf of uh, all the players, if you will, in which the relief that's being sought on behalf of all those players is a medical monitoring fund um, for those players into the future. And so you have the individual litigation and you have the class litigation. Um, I want to address two buckets of issues that relate to uh, what's happening in the litigation. And first, um, there's an issue concerning whether or not these claims, whether the class claim or the individual claims can be brought in the tort system in court, or whether the collective bargaining agreement between the players and the teams essentially preempts the claims and sends the claims off to arbitration. So I think an important thing to remember here is the NFL's position on this is not the claims shouldn't be heard, it's they shouldn't be heard in the court system, that they are a subject of the collective bargaining agreements and they ought to be heard in arbitration, which is where the collective bargaining agreements send disputes. What the league essentially says is, and federal law provides, that if a dispute involves the interpretation of a collective bargaining agreement, um, that that claim is preempted by federal law, Section 301 of uh, the Labor Relations Act, and that those claims should be heard pursuant to the dispute resolution mechanism established in the collective bargaining agreement. Um, and so what the league's position is, is all of the cases involve an interpretation of the collective bargaining agreement. That's going to be the critical issue, or one of the critical issues that Judge Brody's going to have to decide on the motion to dismiss. And so um, the position of the league is um, that the collective bargaining agreement deals with issues concerning player safety, deals with issues concerning player medical care, and in fact, you heard a lot during the, the previous panels this morning about return to play. The collective bargaining agreement specifically addresses return to play issues. And so the NFL's argument at this point is this case at its heart involves interpretations of the collective bargaining agreement. And so this dispute doesn't belong in the tort system in courts. It belongs um, in the arbitration system as established by the uh, collective bargaining agreement. So 
That's one thing to keep in mind. The second issue about how these disputes are going to be resolved um, really has to do with whether these disputes have to be determined on a player-by-player, situation-by-situation basis, or whether the class action provides um, an appropriate means for resolving the controversy. Uh, again, the issue is not whether the claims can or cannot be heard. The issue is really how they should be heard. Um, can they be all aggregated together in a class action, or do they have to turn on the individual facts and circumstances of each player, um, including, for example, what their history of injury was before they got to the league, how much time they actually played in the league, what the extent of any head injury or head trauma they experienced in the league, um, and how their situation was actually managed by um, the team doctors and the teams. Did the team rush them back into play? Did the team follow the kinds of protocol that you heard from Dr. Marino? Um, how were their individual circumstances managed? Um, the league's view on all of this will be um, that these are inherently individualized issues and that the circumstances of each player, what they uh, brought to the league before they got there, what their experience was in the league, um, what their injuries were and how they were treated, those are all incredibly important issues um, in this controversy and they can't all be aggregated in the context of a class action. Now, Andrew wanted me to talk for a minute just to give you an overview of the class action rule. I'm gonna take what could be a couple hour conversation and try to really uh, speed through it. Um, but the federal class action rule is rule 23. And it basically has two pieces to it, rule 23A and rule 23B. 23A says that in order for a class to be certified, um, there has to be numerosity of plaintiffs, and that uh, is clearly true here. There are a large number of former players and current players that would satisfy the numerosity uh, requirement. Um, a critical question, though, is whether there are common questions of law or fact. And I'm going to come back to that, but the Supreme Court in uh, the Walmart versus Dukes case from a couple of years ago really elevated the standard for commonality and will become a very important issue in the NFL litigation. The plaintiff also has to show that the named plaintiffs, the representatives who are suing on behalf of the class, have claims uh, that are typical of the claims of the class members. And finally, that the class members will fairly and adequately, or the class representatives will fairly and adequately represent the interests of the class. Now, commonality, and this, this question of whether the claims of the named plaintiffs are common to the class will be an incredibly important legal issue and factual issue if the case gets past the preemption uh, uh, collective bargaining agreement argument. Here's where the Supreme Court's decision in Walmart versus Dukes from a couple of years comes into play. And there, Justice Scalia, writing on behalf of the majority of the court, um, announced um, a standard for commonality that, quite frankly, is higher than had been interpreted for a number of years. Um, and what Justice Scalia said, among other things, is that the plaintiff has to demonstrate that the class members have suffered the same injury and not just that they have, um, that their claims depend upon the same common contention of law. And what he essentially says is the proof as to one claim, claimant has to be the same as the proof as to the members of the class. What he says is the common contention, quote, must resolve an issue that is central to the validity of each one of the claims in one stroke. So if the evidence that proves the claim as to one player would prove the claim as to the others, that's a common question. Um, what he also said is when a plaintiff is seeking monetary relief in a class action, that is probably not appropriate for the provision of the class action rule that deals with injunctive relief. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But this Walmart versus Dukes case will be an incredibly important piece of the issue for um, the uh, class action determination if the case gets past the preemption stage. The other thing that the plaintiff has to do um, in a class action is satisfy one of the provisions of Rule 23B. And 23B has three subparts 
two of which are potentially applicable here. Um, rule B2 deals with claims for so-called injunctive relief. Um, and that is where um, the, the plaintiff is seeking for an order compelling the defendant, in this case the NFL, to cease doing something or to perform a certain type of activity, a command to stop or a command to take action. Um, B3 deals with claims for damages, where the plaintiff is actually seeking money. Um, and the question of what type of class action will be involved here, whether this is a B2 class, which is what the complaint in the case pleads, or whether it's going to be a B3 class, the damages claim, will be an important legal determination that Judge Brody's going to have to make. Um, most people think that the standard for B2 certification, although the relief that you can get is more limited, is a lower standard than B3 cert certification because B3, to get damages, you have to not only show commonality and the other aspects of Rule 23A, but you have to show that the common issues predominate in the case. Not just that there is a common issue, but the common issues predominate. And a class action is the superior means of resolving the controversy, and a class action would be manageable. Um, a couple of final thoughts to frame this. Um, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals decided a case involving Roman, uh, Roman Haas, it was a toxic tort case called Gates, um, that was decided after the Walmart decision. Um, that case uh, casts considerable doubt over whether a medical monitoring case can satisfy the test for uh, 23B2, the perhaps lower form of relief, uh, the lower standard of proof type of class action. Um, but even there, what the court ended up determining, that was a medical monitoring case involving a toxic tort situation, of the release of pollutants into a neighborhood. What the Third Circuit held was the amount and nature of the exposure that each of the residents in the neighborhood experienced differed from class member to class member. Um, and so therefore, um, the question of whether all of the residents of the neighborhood were entitled to medical monitoring couldn't be resolved on a class-wide basis because there wasn't sufficient commonality and cohesiveness. I think you can expect that if the case gets to the class certification stage, what the NFL will argue is number one, B2 doesn't apply, but even if it does, the amount and nature of time that the players played in the league, um, the, the amount and nature of any head trauma that they experienced, um, the manner in which their head trauma may have been addressed by the teams and the team doctors, those are inherently individual issues. They aren't common, and common issues don't predominate. Um, to the extent the case is a 23B3 case, um, you, have the, uh, you have the heightened standard of predominance. And so that same argument really exists on steroids, if you will. Um, the league's going to say not only aren't there common questions, they clearly don't predominate. Um, you heard Dr. Marino say that all of these cases are individual and it's not one size fits all. The league's going to say um, what these various uh, players experienced whether they had an injury, how those injuries were treated, those all go to the question of, number one, whether the teams or the league violated a duty to these players, and number two, whether the players actually suffered any injury as a result of the way in which they were dealt with by the league. So those are really the main arguments that are gonna be made. Um, I think a lot really depends on um, certainly the, 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 the key opening question is going to be whether or not these claims are preempted and ought to be sent to arbitration. Um, and that will be the initial dispositive issue because if Judge Brody concludes that the claims involve an interpretation of the collective bargaining agreement, essentially all these claims will be left for arbitration. That's going to be tough to follow. Thank you. All right, um, well, I'm going to give you a brief history about how the litigation started and um, then touch generally on the allegations. I'll let Mr. Weiss get into more detail and he can advocate for, for his side, and then I'll touch on the preemption issue. Um, so starting in July of 2011, that's whenever the first concussion lawsuit was filed. It was a personal injury action that was filed out in Los Angeles, in California. 
Shortly thereafter, um, Mr. Weiss, his law firm, they filed the first federal class action here in uh, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. From there, plaintiff's lawyers took note and they said, hey, they're trying to take on the NFL. The NFL is a $9 billion industry. Let's start rounding up players and let's take on the NFL. Um, so lawsuits started being filed all across the country. Um, and the NFL was like, uh-oh, we have a problem on our hands. We need to get this thing consolidated into one single forum. And so the federal courts have a mechanism called multi-district litigation um, that allows for consolidation of all these, these lawsuits. So in January of 2012, uh, the NFL's motion was granted um, that brought every lawsuit, whether it's filed in Florida, California, Missouri, wherever, um, it's now Philadelphia has become the battleground for this litigation. And so now we're at 4,000 players and over 216 complaints. And the first threshold issue is this issue of preemption. And this issue could potentially be a billion dollar issue. Um, and the NFL knows that a lot is at stake here. If the players win on this issue, they're able to successfully defeat the NFL's motion to dismiss, the NFL is going to have to open up uh, their pocketbooks, not necessarily their pocketbooks, but are, they're going to have to open up um, their, I guess, their treasure box, as, as Mr. Weiss would say. Um, and it's going to grant the plaintiff's lawyers an opportunity to go fishing. They're going to go on an expedition of discovery, and they're going to be able to look into all the reasons why the NFL created the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee. Um, the, the Plaintiff's lawyers will have an opportunity to depose Dr. Elliot Pellman, uh, among others, and find out what exactly the NFL knew and when and how they respond, responded to that. So the NFL is going to do everything possible to get this case dismissed without even having to get to the merits of it. So the NFL went out and hired one of the most uh, supreme uh, litigators in all of the country, uh, Mr. Paul Clement, he argued uh, the losing side of, Obama, of the Obamacare case. Um, he's, he's been active in multiple sports law cases. Um, so the NFL hired Paul Clement, and the plaintiff's lawyers also um, hired an appellate law firm in D.C., um, a gentleman by the name of David Frederick, uh, probably wrote the majority of, of the brief. Um, and David Frederick kind of has an interesting relationship uh, David Frederick was a Supreme Court law clerk for Justice Byron Wizard White. And as you may know, Wizard White was also a professional football player for two or three years. And so I think that symbolism is, is great. You're going to have David Frederick, who, whose mentor was uh, Justice, Justice, Justice White, and David Frederick will be arguing uh, the player side. And so on April 9th, Oral arguments will take place, and I certainly advise all, all the law students here, if you can get out of class, to, to make it for those arguments, because that's going to be a Supreme Court-like showdown at the district court level, and a lot is riding on that, that issue. Um, from there, Judge Brody will, will take the matter under consideration to determine whether uh, the players' claims are, are really inextricably intertwined with the terms of the collective bargaining agreement, or if... As the players allege, these are separate common law claims that do not have anything to do with an interpretation of the collective bargaining agreement. And Judge Brody, it'll probably take her a couple months because this is an extremely difficult um, issue, the matter of preemption. Uh, one professor once said that federal labor preemption is one of the most difficult issues in all of American jurisprudence. Um, and then, of course, following Judge Brody's decision, it's more than likely that this case will then be appealed to the Third Circuit. I'm sure the defendants, the NFL, will seek to um, try to file a motion to stay, to continue to prevent the plaintiff's lawyers from engaging in discovery, but I, I doubt Judge Brody will grant that and allow discovery to proceed as this case is pending at the Third Circuit. There's also a potential that this, this case, strictly on the preemption issue, could end up at the Supreme Court level. Uh, I guess that's yet to be seen, and it'll probably take a few years for that to work its way out. But um, that's, that's the preemption issue, and I guess I'll let Mr. Weiss get into the details of the allegations of their complaint. Thanks, Paul. Saul, the world awaits. <laughs> well, I can start. Can you hear me? Yes, 
the mic on? Yes. Yeah. 41 years ago, I graduated from Villanova. I thought I had a solid legal background. I know I was trained to one day be a leader in what I did. The old law school was just up the hill from where we are today. And uh, we had intramural rough touch football teams and we played nearby where the uh, parking lot is. I've been an active on the uh, Board of Consultors uh, for many years and was instrumental along with Gordon and others to raise the funds for this building. So when Andrew asked me to speak, it was a no-brainer. I'm back at Villanova and I'm still co connected to football. So let me say, Andrew, and to Jeff, thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege and an honor. But more importantly, it's a privilege and an honor to be chosen as the co-lead counsel for more than 4,200 retired football players from the NFL. And let me correct one statement. We are only representing players who retired from the game before August the 4th, 2011. That's the date of the last CBA agreement. Now, I was amazed and at the panel number one. And uh, it's not about lawyers. It's about those four athletes who opened up their hearts to all of us about this terrible condition that affects a lot of athletes. And that is they suffer from the effects of brain injuries, either subconcussive or concussive. And so my dreams have come true from the time I graduated from law school. I'm a leader in leading edge litigations. And this is one lawsuit that has captured the hearts and minds of most Americans. Every day we read or see something about someone commenting about the plight of these poor players. So I want to start by telling you our clients do not want to destroy football. They want to preserve the game they love. And that can be accomplished if the league takes steps to protect the players who suffer from brain injuries, and they can do it. And you can see from some of the things that have happened recently that the league is taking some steps. It's a little late. We're going to talk about it. But not only is it about football, this litigation and the public dialogue about concussions has changed a lot of sports. You heard Taylor talk about how soccer's changed. Keith Primo talked about how hockey's changed, lacrosse, not just at the professional level, starting in high school, junior high schools, and in college. Sports are an important part of our educational process, and we have to make sure that the kids who engage in sports do it in a safe manner. So let me tell you a little bit before I jump in and talk with, to the specifics of what Gordon says about what the hurdles are for the players in litigation to what the case is about. The case is about providing security and care to retired players and their families. And you heard uh, from uh, a linebacker, you heard from Brian Restbrook, and I can tell you that I've heard from a lot of players and their wives and their children who talk about how different their lives have become 10, 15, 20 years removed from the sport of professional football. Now, a lot of these players weren't paid a lot of money, and uh, they suffer injuries from chronic headaches, depression, dementia, onset early Alzheimer's disease, and a disease process known as CTE, and you heard one of the doctors talk about CTE. Now, for decades, there's been published literature that talks about a problem long-term with repeated concussive 
and subconcussive impacts. It started in the 20s with boxers, but it's been in the medical literature for quite some time. The lawsuit takes the position that the NFL was well aware of this scientific evidence, and they also knew the risks of repetitive traumatic brain injury. Now, in our complaints, we say that the NFL had a duty to look at this problem and to protect the players. But instead, they deliberately ignored and they actually concealed some of the information from the teams and the team physicians, and they're the ones that were trying to help the players. Okay, so what did the NFL do? They created what was called as a Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee in 1994. I believe over the course of seven or eight years, they issued 16 different papers, all of which said there's no direct evidence or link to concussive injuries and long-term neurological defects. Now, they did studies, though, and they didn't release their studies, and the study shows that I think the players who have had these uh, impacts are six times more greater than general population to have long-term neurological deficits. And that's what this case is about. It's about making the NFL accountable for not being truthful and not protecting the players when they knew there was a big issue. And of course, we all, we used to, we all liked TV and we used to love to watch the most violent hits that the NFL films would show you every week. Now, this is a, a league who has an annual revenue of $9 billion in growing. It's a unincorporated association, not for profit. Its sole existence is to create revenue for its constituent team members, and that's what it does. And so when the NFL says, hold on, we have immunity, you can't sue us because there's something somewhere in a collective bargaining agreement that says if you have a grievance, you go to arbitration. But wait a second. Most of the retired players never signed a contract that was signed with the NFL. That contract was signed with the teams. There's only two instances where a CBA has a signature of the NFL. So that's a legal question. That's a legal defense to the request for preemption. And I can't find a single word in a single CBA agreement that discusses fraud, that discusses the legal consequences for hiding safety information from the players. I can't find an opinion anywhere in the legal system that says that fraud should be preempted. And that's one of the arguments we're going to make on April the 9th in front of Judge Brody. The second thing I want to talk about is the class actions are only to seek medical screening. They're not to seek personal injury, and the law is pretty clear. That's a pretty tough burden. And after AMCHEM, which is a Supreme Court decision involving asbestos uh, claimants, I don't think you can get a certification for personal injury claims. But you can get certification for medical screening. And in fact, one of the first cases allowing for medical screening or monitoring is Redland Soccer right here in Pennsylvania. So we believe that we can meet B3 or B2 when it comes to medical screening or medical monitoring. 
And the law is not clear whether that's a remedy or a legal theory. But in any event, there have been cases in which these claims have been certified. And we want to talk about commonality. Well, every single player has the same gripe. That is, I need to be screened. I need to be tested. I don't know if my memory loss, as the linebacker said, at age 35, 36, or 40 years old, is because I'm that old. And by the way, I'm 66, and my memory's going. But or is there another reason? Is it because I play professional football and I got my bell rung more than one time and there are tests that can be done and the player should have them and they shouldn't have to pay for them? The league that makes $9 billion a year and glorifies violence, that's who should be paying for the medical screening. Now, once a player is found to have a problem, then he should file a lawsuit, an individual lawsuit against the league. And over 4,200 players of approximately, I think there's over 16,000, Andrew, retired players that are still living, maybe more. They want their day in court. And they should have their day in court. And they shouldn't have to go to arbitration. And I got to tell you, What's more efficient, having one lawsuit to resolve these issues or have 4,000 mini arbitrations where you're going to have different decisions by different arbitrators? And guess what? The Federal Arbitration Act says when you have that and you want to take appeal, you go back to district court. They're going to be in the same place they want to escape from. So from a efficiency point of view, I think having the case in federal court will save money and save time. And some of these players don't have the time. So that's my initial response to what Gordon had to raise. Appreciate it. Uh, I think rather than me ask questions, I'd like maybe to hear the response from Gordon and Paul in terms of, you've heard the arguments, I know you're limited on what you can say with ongoing litigation, but you've heard the arguments, how would you respond? Appreciate it, Andy. So I, I think the first thing I'd say is the case is not about immunity and the defense position is not about immunity. The NFL is not arguing that the claims can't be heard and shouldn't be heard and shouldn't be decided on the merits. The question is where and under what standards. Um, and what the league is essentially saying is this case involves workplace safety in a unionized setting in which workplace safety, including return to play and medical care issues, are addressed in the CBA. They've long been a subject of bargaining. Um, and that as a result, this case will involve an interpretation of the CBA. And so therefore, the place where these uh, disputes should be resolved is in the arbitration setting um, pursuant to the collective bargaining agreement. Second, the fact of non-signature is not at all dispositive. Uh, the Stringer case and other cases have essentially said that that is not relevant to this issue, um, that if the case involves an interpretation of the CBA, the claims are preempted. In terms of medical monitoring, um, if the case proceeds in, in federal court and is not part of um, an arbitration, um, the claims are going to be governed by state law. And state law, not only are the factual issues in this case highly individualized, there are going to be extremely um, predominating and different issues of law that are applied. Because um, medical monitoring is um, a relatively recent creation of the law, and state law treats it very differently from one place to the next. Um, in some places, uh, medical monitoring is recognized. Um, in some places, it's not recognized. In those places where it's recognized, 
Some see it as a remedy that's provided if another cause of action is established. Um, in some places, it's an independent cause of action. Um, and frankly, the elements of what you need to satisfy to get monitor medical monitoring vary from state to state. One of the critical issues from the defense perspective in the class action is the court is going to have to apply the law of perhaps all 50 different jurisdictions um, in looking at these player claims um, from different states. And that's an additional reason why um, individual issues predominate. Um, a couple of final points. Um, that uh, Mr. Weiss talked about um, that what they're seeking is screening, and then if the screening shows a problem, the players would have a lawsuit for damages. Um, there are a couple of significant issues there. Um, it is hardly clear that if the players litigate the, uh, the claims in the class action and it goes to judgment, it's, it's not clear that they will get a second bite at the apple. Um, that may be dispositive of all their claims. Um, and so there's an interesting and significant issue about what would be the preclusive and final effect of any judgment in the class action. Secondly, if you were to assume for purposes of discussion that that judgment was not preclusive and all what we're doing in the class action is setting the stage for more individual cases, there's a legitimate question as to whether any efficiency is served by that. So again, the question here is not whether the merits of these disputes are going to be reached, it's how. Are they going to be reached um, with some discovery, with expert witnesses, um, in the context of the arbitration under federal labor law and the CBA. Um, and if it proceeds in federal court, do these cases have to turn on the individual facts and the individual uh, applicable law, um, including such things as what was uh, the player's experience in injury history before becoming part of the league? How long were they in the league? What was their head trauma? Was their head trauma, if any, treated properly by the players? Those are individual issues. The question of whether the players suffered an injury uh, and whether there, was, whether there was a breach of a duty of care of those treating the player, they are inherently individual and not appropriate for, for class certification, so the league will argue. Great, thanks. Paul? Well, Mr. Weiss's opening statement was, was certainly great, and that's what a jury may get to hear someday. Um, there's no doubt the equities of this case almost scream injustice. Whenever you read, uh, you open up the paper every day and you hear sad stories about former NFL players suffering, it, it tugs at our heartstrings, no doubt. But the biggest issue right now, and that could be that dispositive issue, is this issue of preemption. Um, that's the biggest hurdle right now facing the players. Right now, the, the courtroom door is slightly open. And if the players are able to successfully defeat the NFL's motion, it's a ticket for them to remain in court and then to engage in this long process of discovery. Um, and there's, there's two bodies of law that Judge Brody can follow, um, generally. And you have almost a, a, a long line of, of sports law cases where players have tried to sue in, individual teams, the NFL, uh, Major League Baseball. And generally, the conclusion of those cases are that they're preempted and they have to go to arbitration. And then on the other side of the coin, you have the Third Circuit precedent. And it's pretty, it's, it's in, in favor of, of the plaintiff side, um, especially on, on the fraud claims. So we'll, we'll see how Judge Brody uh, rules on that issue. But even that, there is also a gap period where there was never a CBA in place. And that should almost take out this whole issue of preemption. And that is prior to 1968, there was not a CBA, CBA in place. And then between 1988 and 1993, there was also not a CBA in place. So let's assume for the sake of argument that Judge Brody does decide to grant the NFL's motion to dismiss whenever the CBA was in place. There is a chance that uh, the players that only played prior to 1968 and during that specific gap period of 88 and 93, just those claims alone could survive. You know, it's a small chance, but it certainly is a chance nonetheless. The briefing on that, on that issue, it, it really wasn't brought to light, and I suspect that Judge Brody will ask a lot of questions uh, wanting to address that, that issue. Um, 
And then secondly, I guess we can, we can touch briefly on the science of concussion. Um, as, as we all know, the science has advanced significantly just in the past few years. And the player's argument is essentially that the NFL has been aware of the long-term risk of concussion all the way since the inception of football, uh, the, since the 1920s. However, the medical community, it, they were in great flux. In the medical lit literature in the 70s, all the way up until the 90s. Unfortunately, the, community, the medical community did not really know. And there's, there's specific statements in these learned treatises and textbooks of neurology that say concussion is a benign injury that quickly heals itself. Of course, we clearly know that's not the case. But that's something that, will be, that, will have, that the players are going to have to show, that the NFL had a duty to warn the players, and nonetheless, they breached that duty. But to point back and say that the retired players or the guys that played in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, I think, I think it's going to be a very difficult argument. And that circles back around to the retirees. You know, they, these are the guys, especially the pre-93 guys that were never paid millions and millions of dollars. These are the guys that are, are suffering the most. And yet again, they may end up being foreclosed and not having a, a strong claim, like the guys, in my opinion, that played from the 90s, probably from 1994 up until 2009, 2010, whenever the medical science was really starting to evolve. Um, but, but again, that, that will certainly be an issue that will be litigated throughout this case. So you've heard what everyone says, what people say to me, I'm sure they say to you. These guys know they're, they're not going out there to play tiddlywinks. They're going to hit their head against people. That's what they do. And then you heard the panel this morning, guys that ignore baseline testing, that want to go back in, worried about the next play, the next contract, the next practice, certainly not worried about 20 years from now. How do you respond to that? What are the legal arguments to that? Well, that's a good question. I can do it in two parts. Professional football players knew when they played the game there was a risk of physical injury. And they bargained for that risk by getting paid. No one told them that there was a risk that they were in their 40s and 50s, they would have dementia, early onset memory problems, they would have rage and depression issues that far exceed the number of such problems in the general population. So they didn't know it. And just look at Alex Smith, he's the perfect illustration. He chose not to go back to play because he wants to have a productive life after football. That's number one. And number two, if you look at all of the CBA contracts from the beginning until even 2011, not one of those contracts mentions repeated head impacts, what their risks were, or protocols for removing players from the game who had their bell rung. So what I like about this litigation, and I like about the civil justice system, is that we get to air this out. And the players may not win, but they can. But we, as a society, will benefit. Because the young kids are going to be protected while these old guys pay the price. And that's my argument. Gordon? I, I do think, and this is just from my perspective, uh, as, a, uh, as a father of a young son, that, that, that the debate that is fostered here is a very important one. Um, regardless of the legal consequences in lawsuits like the one that, that Saul has brought on behalf of the former players, um, the, the bright light 
um, that this litigation, the NCA litigation, and well-publicized um, uh, stories like some of the ones you heard this morning, I think are doing a lot of good uh, for all kinds of, uh, for parents, for uh, programs at the amateur level. Um, you know, I happen to think that that uh, from a class standpoint, these are uh, these are very tough claims um, from the plaintiff's perspective. Um, but sometimes litigation has the uh, indirect consequence of raising sensitivity and raising awareness. And maybe the litigation isn't the answer to addressing the problem, but it certainly raises awareness and causes all of us to think about how we act uh, and what we do to make sure we protect our children um, and to make sure that sports are as safe as they can be. Paul, what are your reactions when you hear Saul talk about the case and chances for success? Yeah, I, I certainly agree. Uh, Mr. Weiss hit it right on the head. Um, society, all of us in society, have, have benefited from this litigation. I think the best thing about this litigation has already occurred. It has brought awareness about concussion and the serious risks that go along with concussion. So that's, that's a plus. So regardless if they're successful or not, we're talking about concussion on a daily basis. Um, secondly, I guess, Professor Brant, in regard to the assumption of the risk defense, you know, I, I think, again, Mr. Weiss is probably correct on that. I think the players assume the risk of, of physical injuries, of knee injuries. However, they may have not been specifically warned, nor did they have knowledge of the potential risk of traumatic brain injuries and long-term neurological problem, problems. So I, th I think the players will succeed on the assumption of risk argument. Nonetheless, there are still multiple other legal hurdles that they are going to have to overcome that, that will be played out. So to me, this kind of all bubbled up with the 2009 congressional hearings yep. where Commissioner Goodell and uh, union head Demora Smith were called on the carpet not doing enough, being lax, even being compared to the tobacco industry. Is it your theory that, like the, pardon the pun, smoking guns, that came out with the tobacco industry will also be exposed here. Uh, you're right about that, and some of those documents have been made public. I mean, I believe Roger Goodell testified that the league didn't know about some of the events that took place while they're doing their uh, committee work between 94 and 2008. Uh, documents were uh, mentioned in our complaint. Uh, they show a different side of the story. And uh, I think that's the tipping point, Andrew. The congressional hearing, I believe, was the tipping point for all this coming out. And uh, I know that D. Smith and uh, Roger Goodell don't see eye to eye. The union and the league don't see eye to eye about this. Uh, but the pawns have been the players, and that's the problem. And so their courage in coming forward, and it is co courageous to do that, to, to put their private lives in public uh, is remarkable. Uh, Ray Easterling, who was our client, uh, we talked to Ray a lot. He couldn't take it. He killed himself. Duerson killed himself. Junior Sale killed himself. You're talking about people taking their lives. Uh, Kevin Turner, who played full, uh, fullback here in Philadelphia, I've met Kevin a couple times over the years. He's got ALS. Steve Smith, who's much younger than uh, Kevin Turner, got, doesn't have much longer to live, and the way he's living is horrible. He's in a ventilator, stuck in a bed. There are so many stories about these players, about what they suffered, that something has to be done. And I think that's what this is all about. But what didn't the NFL do for them that caused these traumatic events? Well, I can say it this way. If you look at the collective bargaining agreements over the years, they have strengthened the payments for players who need, for example, knee replacements, have back problems. Uh, they just neglected 
the brain side of the equation. We gotta, it's got to be fixed. But as the panel before us, the Dr. Marino, we don't know the signs, correct? We haven't known, we still don't. Well, let's, I can tell you that uh, Ann McKee and Bob Cantu and Chris Nowitzki up in Boston, and you know them, Andrew, uh, Ann published in Brain in December of 2012 a definitive study. I think they looked at 66 or 80 some uh, brains of deceased people who had suffered some sort of uh, concussive type injury either in the service or playing football or soccer. I believe 34 of them were uh, professional football players from the AFL or NFL. 33 of the 34 had demonstrative CTE. And then they went out and they had independent psychologists interview the families and they develop a set of criteria and they can classify between CTE 1, 2, 3, and 4, 4 being the worst, what the symptoms are. So some of these players in all sports are presenting with these symptoms. They're, they're showing definitive signs of CTE. I gave Dr. Uh, when I came off the stand, there is a study that was published two days ago in radiology where they can actually see brain atrophy one year after uh, concussion, which is a symptom of CTE. Uh, there are doctors who use PET scans and other type of uh, diagnostic studies in which they can show brain changes in living people. This is a serious problem. Quickly want to ask Paul, you've talked about where's the union in all this? Okay, where's the NFLPA? A lot of attention on the liability of the NFL. What about the union? Yeah, you know, the, the union is created to protect the players. And the question becomes, if the NFL was concealing or misrepresenting the link between repeated, repeated hits to the head and later life cognitive decline, where was the players association? Why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they negotiate for better benefits? Where have they been? They've been on the sidelines, not saying a thing, because they know that there's a chance that they could be drug into this litigation also. Um, the Players Association was privy to those exact same studies published in the 1920s all the way up until now that linked repeated hits to the head and later life cognitive decline. Why didn't the Players Association bring that to the table? Why didn't they negotiate? And that falls into labor issues. Um, one, one thing that I will touch on, I mean, it, it goes back to, it seems like the retirees, tragically, are always the ones that are, that are left to fend for themselves. And it's unfortunate. There's no doubt about that. Um, but one, one thing that, I mean, just from the most recent CBA, the players and the NFL negotiated a new neurocognitive benefits plan. And as part of this, I, mean, I, I think it's so poorly poorly negotiated, it's, it's almost ridiculous. Um, part of this neurocognitive benefits is a player can receive $1,500 to $3,000 a month if they're showing mild or moderate cognitive impairment. However, the benefits stop at the age of 55, whenever you would presume that brain injuries are going to get worse. So I think that's just another matter of the NFLPA failing their players and the retirees. Thanks, Paul. What I'd like to do, I know we're running out of time. Your predictions, I don't mean to make this like the odds, but they were taking odds on who is the next pope, so why not? Um, what will happen in this lawsuit, both on the preemption argument, April 9th, and potentially beyond? And where does this lawsuit go? Are we going to be talking about this for years? Um, it, it's always tough to predict how a individual judge is going to uh, rule in an individual case. Um, I think the NFL has very strong arguments in favor of preemption. Um, but um, MDL judges often think that their job is to manage the discovery that's necessary in an MDL to try to package a resolution. And so it will take some political will on Judge Brody's part to say, you know what, I think this whole dispute 
turns on an interpretation of the collective bargaining agreement, at least in part. And so therefore, I'm going to disband the MDL and send everybody off to arbitration. And so I think the arguments are, are very strong, Andrew, but it will take considerable will. Um, if the case goes past preemption, I think that the NFL's arguments against class certification are extraordinarily strong. Um, and it will be very difficult for the plaintiff to get a class certified, which doesn't mean the individual cases don't go forward. It just means it won't go forward as a class. Even with Saul Weiss representing him. That's the best thing that the plaintiffs have going for them. <laughs> Paul, predictions? Yeah, I mean, I, this preemption issue is, is almost a coin toss. And again, I would definitely suggest everybody to go watch this argument because it's going to be great. Um, but I, I do see, it's probably a fool's errand to predict this, but I do see the fraud claims surviving um, and also the claims between that, that gap period also surviving. The players will go into discovery and if they're able to find that smoking gun, um, then I think a global settlement will be reached. I do not see class certification occurring here. I, I just think it's too, too difficult, too many individualized issues. I mean, the quintessential fact of concussion is that it is an individual issue and it affects each person differently. Um, but I, I really think after this preemption issue is decided, it'll, it'll be kind of telling. If the NFL immediately wants to start talking about a settlement, then I think that'll show that maybe the NFL does have some dirty laundry that they don't want the players, uh, the plaintiff's lawyers seeing. Um, but on the other hand, I think if that's not the case and a global settlement isn't reached or discussed, the discovery process will be long, drawn out. There'll be multiple fights. I mean, the parties were arguing over how long a brief can be. Um, that's just one issue. And you can imagine how wide ranging the, the discovery disputes will be. And this thing will drag on. I think the NFL initially said that they're gonna need up until 2018 just to complete the discovery stage. Of course, that's way, way too much time. It'll probably take four years to finish the discovery and all the pretrial uh, proceedings. And then the case may be sent back to their originating district for trial. And we may see, we may have a, an indicator case or a bellwether case that's tried um, to see exactly how these cases will work out. And I, I think a great case for that would be Junior Seau's, uh, his wrong, wrongful death case. I, I think he played in an era in which uh, concussion was, was generally known. And I mean, the equities of his case also scream uh, in, injustice to an extent. And I think that'll be a great case for the parties to really determine how does the jury respond to these arguments. And if the case, there's a jury verdict in favor of the plaintiffs, then I think that will certainly force a global settlement altogether. But if, let's say for example, that uh, the Bellwether case is, is a, a defense verdict, then I think the NFL will continue to try cases for the next 15 to 20 years. Thanks, Paul. So, last word on this. This is a unique litigation. There will be a lot of twists and turns, and there'll be a lot of opportunities uh, for a long period of time uh, for the parties to try to get together. Uh, it took a long time to bring the tobacco companies to the table. It took a long time early on to get the pharmaceutical companies to the table. Uh, and it could take years to bring the NFL to the table, but I can tell you that the players have the will and the desire to see it through. And so I can't predict when or how this case will resolve. All I can tell you is we're going to give it our best shot every step of the way. We'll be watching. Fascinating panel. Let's thank everyone. <laughs> <laughs>